Dmitrij Gluchowski to rosyjski pisarz młodego pokolenia, autor bestsellerowej powieści Metro 2033. Jego książki wydawane są na całym świecie, w ponad 20 krajach i tym razem Dmitri wraca z nową książką. Tekst. Jest to powieść realistyczna, a nie science fiction i w tej chwili Dmitri wysiada z samolotu, żeby przyjechać tutaj, usiąść na tym krześle i porozmawiamy sobie na temat nowej książki i o tym, jak to jest być pisarzem. Zapraszam serdecznie. Hey man. Hello. How are you? I'm very good. Well, relatively good, you know, it's uh, the older you get, the less it's it gets the, the less probable it is to, to, to be very good. It's acceptable. So I heard you got a new book coming. <laughs> well, uh, relatively new. In, in Russia it came out like in June. We're in November now, so it's coming out. Of, Poland is the first country to translate it into foreign language. So uh, yeah, it's coming out. Actually, it's, it just came out today. Have you read it? <laughs> I, no, I actually didn't re I, I just once read it after like writing everything. I don't really reread my own books, you know. Uh, the time is too short and uh, I'd rather read something that I haven't read before. Do you give it to your wife to read it first before you publish she doesn't, it? She doesn't read anything that I write. She doesn't like it? No, no, she, she thinks that it's all the sex scenes were copied from my life and uh, she's, um, she's comfortable reading them. Uh, some of them maybe. But, you, but you're not no, going to say know which one. About yeah. It, no. yeah, but you know, as a writer, you probably need to... Um, get inspired. Yeah, get inspired, get influenced exactly. by, by your own Precisely. personal life, yes. right? So, <laughs> this new book, uh, you basically hit the topic of um, hijacking someone else's identity and then leading a double life. Is it a spoiler or...? It's not a spoiler, no, no, no. It's, it's actually the, the premise of the book. Uh, so the story is, it's, it's about a young guy who gets into jail on false accusations of drug trafficking and trade because of fighting with a drug enforcement policeman in a nightclub. So he's getting planted a sack of cocaine. He's getting sent to jail for seven years on this false accusation and, uh, and charges. And he's getting back, and he discovers that he has no life at all remaining. His friends are afraid of him now. His girlfriend has long dumped him. The worst of thing is his mother dies just what, days before he gets back after seven years in, in jail. And so he, he gets drunk the first night, and he finds through a Facebook post the guy who jailed him because he's still having a nice social life. And murders him, and that's the first. Oh, that's the spoiler. No, that's not the spoiler. The first two, two chapters, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah, the first two, two chapters out of like sixteen, mm -hmm. and uh, the interesting things start to happen just after when he picks the guy's cell phone, and in order to get away, yeah. get away from that, he starts like texting for that guy as if the guy was still alive. And then the the most interesting things actually they unfold during the remaining fourteen chapters. Correct. I've read the book. You read the book? Yeah, of course. You finished do you, it. Do you, do you, it just came out today. How, how do you manage Do you it? suppose uh, someone could do an interview without reading a Well, book? I am a former journalist. You do that all the time. <laughs> Who the fuck is that today in, the, in our radio studio? Oh, that's uh, the singer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I enough. know that, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I've read the book. Um, I quite liked it. And, and it's not a sci-fi book, which is, which is new for you, right? You know, I had um, uh, uh, quite liked it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a worrying sign. Uh, I'm not sure if the translation is as genius as the original, uh, but uh, I hope so. Now, um, I, tr I tried all kind of genres before. You know, I of course, pe people mainly know Metro, right? 2033 and 34 and 35. But I had a story, like a book called "The Stories of Motherland." I think it's it's "Welcome to Russia" in Polish, which is a political satire. And then I used to work as a journalist and reporter, and then I had a, a number of political columns, like like pure political things, but political and social, not having anything to do with the, the sci-fi. Then the book Chas Smeshko, I think it's it's uh, just uh, like my tribute to Latin American magical realism. So I'm I'm trying all all different things, not just post-apocalyptic survival things, you know. And uh, this one is pure realism. Uh, with some signs of criminal thriller or criminal drama, but actually, most of all, I think it's it's a book about today's Russia and what what it's really like, 
and the, the main themes that are like preoccupying people and people are concerned with, and just the ambience and the atmosphere. Uh, so, but, but yes, it's kind of a thriller. Let's say it's a thriller. Okay, um, so you, you've, uh, you've had a long uh, way uh, as a writer, right? You've been writing since you were a teenager, and you started off by publishing your first book online. And do you suppose you, you, you still can go back to that kind of writing, uh, like publishing to the readers first and then maybe publishing with the publisher, or, or is it done? No, it's not done. You, you can try new things in new media for the new stories, you know? And that's what I've been doing all the time. As soon as there was a new platform offering new opportunities, I would spring and uh, use these opportunities. I'm slightly disoriented. What is I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do in the age of YouTube, but for, for, for text, for example, uh, I've tried live broadcasts. Instead of publishing the chapters on paper, I was reading live broadcasts to... Vkontakte, which is the Russian clone of, of Facebook. We all know. You, you, all, you know that, uh, right? Probably, yeah. All the, all the pirate content and all the incredible movies from the 20s, they, you can just see there streaming. But you, you don't use it that way, right? You don't pirate stuff. You no, know, you don't download it, so it's, it's not considered piracy. It's considered like sharing the culture or, or you know, like... Sharing the commonwealth. Sharing the commonwealth and the, the, the copyright-free things, of course. So I decided to share my own story there, and, and uh, we've been broadcasting live readings of myself, and they, they helped me doing that, like spreading it to the like book library communities you know, and stuff. So. so that was like quite an innovative thing to do for that one. And maybe, why not, if there is some new, like, and that was, of course, for free. So um, I read like first six chapters out of ten, and then the book came out, and I like, was a bit busy like all the, the, these trips and, and visits and, and the book presentation. But I'm considering actually completing this series. Maybe opening, like, I have my own YouTube channel. It has zero subscribers. So far. Nice. Yes. Uh, Not so even one? I had a one that had 57. Uh, then I started a new one. Now it has just zero. Uh, so, yeah. And um, I, I'll give you a link. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning. It's probably very interesting <laughs> with, uh, with the content. Yeah, there. yeah, but but I'm I'm planning actually to put my readings on there, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe maybe gain some new readers through that, and then uh, read the entire book chapter by chapter with the right music composed by the composers, right? Especially for that book. Nice. And then just yeah, why, why not try that? That's a nice experience, man. I like it. Have you ever fantasized about you know becoming someone else? Because uh, you probably don't know, and there was this famous um, Polish actor called Gustav Holubek, and he said once that um, he doesn't know too much about acting, but what he does know is that people from the very beginning want to become someone else that they already are. I mean, real, little children dress up, they pretend to be someone else, and it gets, uh, it, it, it evolves as we grow older, and we, we want to uh, get rid of our shortcomings. We want to be someone else than we already are, and this is something you wanted to explore in this in this book. Uh, I think that these like I, I see it as two separate questions. Do I want to be someone else? I, I considered becoming a film producer before Harvey Weinstein changed the rules of the game. I mean, no, I like the old <laughs> rules of the game, except for harassment. But now that you cannot really uh, uh, make a compliment to an actress, I don't think that makes sense to become a film producer again. So um, maybe just a film director. Um, yeah, but uh, speaking about like trying to live your character's life, uh, definitely like an actor, a good author, which I'm not, is supposed to reincarnate according to Stanislavski's methods, and become a live, be able to live a life, a little life of your character. You have to really get into his skin or her skin. So that's like acting and That's writing. like acting. And really? just like the fear of an actor, of a theatrical actor that comes out on a stage and he's just completely overwhelmed by panic, same fear I have all, every time that I'm starting a new book, that this time I will definitely fail. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I fail. But, you know, uh, I think that there is much in common between the actor's work and the, the writer's work. 
But reincarnation is definitely one of those similarities. Can you talk about your creative process a little bit more? Because uh, I heard once that um, inspiration is for amateurs and professionals just sit down and do eight hour day work mm. and, and they just finish, they do their stuff. Uh, so it's basically like a job. And I guess a lot of people think uh, about being a creative is more about you know going back and forth uh, And, in room. and and trying trying <laughs> to grasp yeah. something in yeah. your imagination, then like, oh my god, that's it! Like a lightning bolt, and just sitting down writing it in a week, and that's mainly how how it's portrayed in movies. Like, oh my god, I got this great idea, now I got to sit down and write it down. Uh, and and Stephen King says that, that that's not how it works. You just basically sit down and write. Well, that 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 depends. You know, if you're a true professional, then you just produce or manufacture story or tax or letters. But first of all, I don't consider myself as a true professional. I don't have, unlike Stephen King, I don't have an objective of producing a certain amount of characters and spaces a day. I'm not treating that as a target. The target is, to, each time that I'm sitting to write a new book, do something different from whatever I've done before. And you cannot just manufacture that as planned, you know. You really need to get inspired. You need to stop. You need to forget how to write, to, to, to reinvent it a year later or two years later. You need to get impressed and absorb some new things from your own life or life of people who surround you or political environments or your personal traumas and dramas. You have to be able to, to generalize and get some new, fresh inputs that you will transfer into your new story so that it's nothing like you've done before. Because people get older, they live through new emotions and new situations that they have not confronted before. And, and you need to talk about it. You need to, to share your discoveries, trivial discoveries, because everyone is going through the same stages in, in their lives, you know. But you can sum them up, you can find a new language, a new wording for them, and put them on paper, on the screen. So I wouldn't say that I am the guy who by, defi by, by definition would produce a certain amount of text every day. No, I got an idea for the book. It can brew in my head for years. It's text, I had this idea six years ago. Then I was postponing it and delaying it. I was gathering like feelings, ideas, and then I, I felt that I was ripe for writing that story. So I set myself a deadline. I announced that deadline to my publisher and to the readers, and I said, like, I'm delivering it on that date. And then, that's the only way to, to, to force myself to work, you know. Do you have to do that? I like have to force? announce my deadline and say, like, I'm giving you my tooth, and I, like, I'm doing that on time, you know. And then you start failing because you don't have inspiration. Yeah, the time is running out, you're horrible stressed, you start, like, getting gray hair because of that, or nervous tick or something, because you feel that you're gonna shit your yeah, you pants gotta, now. You gotta deliver. You right. gotta deliver. Right. And then, slowly, you are immersing yourself into the creative working condition, state of mind. And I don't think it's a production or a schedule, but I also don't think that it's, uh, it's kind of waiting for inspiration and, until it strikes you. For six years, nothing fucking, like, you know, was striking my head. I had to really sit down and starting to focus and switch off the internet and Wi-Fi and throw away fucking cell phones and focus on that story and start thinking about it alone, locked in a room. I would probably most likely compare it to, the, to a shaman summoning spirits from the you know, lower world or from the upper world or wherever. From the subconscious. From the subconscious, yes. I'm not a mystical guy. I don't think that it's the, the providence that's got in my head. I think it's kind of, you're, you're trying to open the, the basement of your subconscious and get there. You know, every night we were having craziest things delivered to us in numbers, like 10 to, like, 10 to, I don't know, like 15 dreams every night that takes us into unimaginable places, get us, tell us craziest stories with the photorealistic pictures and uh, very complicated characters. They're here, they're there, you know, you just, I think that when you're writing, you are turning slowly into your subconscious. And then the, the brightest things, the, the coolest things, they come just 
pam, as a, as a, you know, as a flash, not when they're constructed. But you have to construct too. Yeah. The plot, especially when it's a like thriller or a sci-fi book, not just your life story. You have to construct things, you know. Well, I guess I guess it's kind of a similar to almost every creative uh, profession. Uh, meaning uh, a musician, uh, an actor. It's it's going to the places you don't want to go, you don't want to visit, and then like re-emerging, having learned something else about yourself. It's a hero's journey. Right. Yes. Joseph Campbell. But, right. Well, yeah, exactly. But but not not like that in in journalist work. The more routine you have, the more you're treading the same paths mm. that you have already it's more mechanical. went, the more mechanical it is and the less creative it is. It's becoming creative when it's for the first time, when you're discovering something. This is precisely why I don't want to be repeating myself because I just lose the feeling for it. I feel that I'm reproducing things. So, okay, let's say I, I, I know what the successful formula is, the formula that works, that makes the teenager say, oh my God, such a good book. But, I, know, I, I know feeling. what you're referring to, like Harry you Potter, know. right? Yeah, so, so, so you don't want to be there again. Okay, you, you know how to concoct, like manufacture bestseller, but fuck it, you know. Uh, I, I have enough money to pay my life. I don't want to become a commercial author that stamps two books a year, which are all the same, and just, just for the sake of what, you know. This is my own exploration. This is how I can fulfill myself. Like, I want to go higher. I want to achieve things. At least, if I cannot do better, I, do, I want to do new things. I want to get excited about it. If I'm repeating myself, like, I'm the guy who's getting bored very quickly with doing the same thing. I can see that. Yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stay at the same job for more than three years. I just got bored incredibly. I had the coolest job working in Euronews television in France. I had an international group of people around me, young guys from all European countries, very outgoing, very cool, and I mastered additional professions within the second year of my work there. The third year, I was prepared to go and hang myself because it was so, became so boring. I was like doing again what I've already done. So I was almost the only one person from the Russian team who left Euronews in spite of France and life there and because I just couldn't, I was having like, you know, hysterical state of you know, depression because I couldn't repeat all over and over again every day things that I've already learned and done. I want to do something new. Then I went to work as a TV reporter at Russia Today, you know, the uh, devilish channel, uh, which was pretty nice Is back at the time. Is it that devilish or? No, it's, it's just no, little, that's little the bit fucking, like fucking devils, you know. Uh, is, it, is it a little less propagandistic embassy. in US or? Sorry? Or is it a little less propagandistic in the US or is it the same? It's they got it's, you know, it's, it's, both it's, channels. It's much Russia. more awkward and blunt and primitive. Mm -hmm. And I think that American propaganda, it's kind of well right now with Trump, things are going straight to hell. Well the the, the American media that was supposed to be objective, they're just, you know, focusing the entire strength to just kill fucking Trump, you know. It's it's your fault according to the conspiracy theories. He's he's an agent. It's not my fault. Okay. Probably, I was going to say Russians it was probably it. your fault. But Russians did it. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that Russians are so powerful and mighty. Even if they tried to, to troll American elections, and I'm sure they tried to troll, they uh -huh. did, didn't really hope to be able to influence the super complicated American electoral machine. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not as easy to do. And then plus, Trump is not a really good partner. They, they would, I think Dimitri, they would, yeah. let's not get political. This, this, it's well, not, what it's I think they, they tried to do, they tried to discredit the American election system. That, that's a realistic target. I don't want you to be dead by tomorrow, so yeah, no, no. let's... let's. Yeah, I've, I've been telling much worse things and I'm still around, you know. <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, cool. That's already an achievement. Yeah. Um, you, you've been pretty close with your fans, right? Online and offline as well. I like meetings and book signings. Because I think, I think it's an energy exchange. I see people, the real people who r really read this crap that I write, and they come there and they smile and they're like, oh my God, can I hug you? And this is very moving. I mean, like, not only they spend the money on this shit, but they also, like, come there from, sometimes from a different city, just to talk and see, and I'm very grateful to them, really. So I'm always staying till the very last person, and taking all the photos, because I, I'm just, I wanna say thank you guys 
for doing that. At the same time, they're coming there, and, and I'm trying not to disappoint them, and they, they're coming for the energy. They're not just coming for the fucking signature, you know, it means nothing. Well, I guess some of them do. Well, some of them do, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, like if I'm going to meet, I don't know, like George Martin, whatever, mm. like I want to talk to him, you know, I want to like hear things that he's saying. Like, like, you know, it's not like Santa doesn't exist, but George Martin does, you know, so. Um, Are you influenced by George Martin? No. A little bit, maybe, he showed, but more by, by Jonathan Little with the, the Kindly Ones, you know, that book about the SS in the Eastern Front. Uh, but George Martin also, like, showed that you can do unspeakable things in the books. Before that, I was a bit more shy as an author. But uh, after reading certain examples with the books with, with anti-heroes in the middle, mm -hmm. in the center of the story, I just thought to allow myself more. I wouldn't say that that's George Martin's, you know, although I think that he, he, he brought an entire wave of dark fantasy where you are allowed to do like rape and whatever, genocide and homicide and sister fucking brothers and then like, you know, killing kids, things like that. Yeah, well, well, when people felt a bit more relaxed about it. When Johnny Cash sang, I shot a man in Reno, everyone lost their mind. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. everything happens. Uh, For the pro first time. Progressively. Right? Yeah, progressively. So who influences you? Who would you say is, uh, has, has had the biggest influence in, on, you, on your work? Ooh, I have no idea now. Like I, before that, I was quoting a Latin American magic realists like Marcus and Cortázar, but that was back at the time when I was 20. Right now, I think I'm, I'm trying to, like every book I'm reading, and I'm trying mainly to, to read big authors who were unknown to me so far, because I miss them. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn things. I'm, 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 I'm currently reading to learn, not to entertain myself. To entertain, I'm watching shows. But literature, I'm, I'm taking that as example to learn. Like, so I'm seeing like how these are that big, reputated and being a renowned author treated, let's say, love or hatred or plot or ending, you know? How can you speak about feelings? How can you describe a life scene? And, and I'm, I'm trying to absorb things from them. At the same time, I think that uh, there are always things to learn, like from the language. I'm still writing in Russian. I wouldn't dare to be really writing like a story in any other language, including English. And, and that I have my inspirations for the last three books, the last two books, from the, the first half of the 20th century. The, the, you know, the, the new communist prose, when it just appeared, when they were breaking the rules, they, they, they were calling upon the new world to come, and they were breaking the existing rules of the traditional Russian language, of the classical Russian language, and reinventing it, breaking it, before it became institutionalized, before they became officially recruited by the Communist Party, when they were enthusiastic about like breaking the foundations of the world world. So they have reinvented, the, like Babel, Platonov, and then some others like Mayakovsky, and then at the same time, the downside of that new world, of this utopian world that they were bringing, the concentration camps, the labor camps, you know, Gulag, like Varlam Shalam of Solzhenitsyn. So you, you got, you got, Amazing really? book, by the way. Huh? Amazing book, by the way. Yes. Oh, yeah. And then uh, all, all of what I quoted is is really shattering your mind when you're reading that. So uh, very nice yeah. description of the communists. I'm anti-communist, but who, what's who interesting is, who for is me, pro, who is pro-communist? Well, there are people like there, there are people who are nostalgic. Because there are teenagers who are fans of Stalin, who who jack off to Stalin's portraits, like a, like a European youth jacks off to Che Guevara in Russia. That's pretty unimaginable, but there, there are. Yeah, but that sort of, sort of falls off when you get like a little older, by like 25, 30, if you're still uh, Che Guevara idealistic. falls off, Che Guevara falls off. Yeah. When you, when, you re, when you learn that Che Guevara was enjoying shooting people in the head, Nah, then you start doubting whether he's really your character. Well, I guess I guess um, this sort of idealism, mm, which I shared, is uh, is noble. I want everyone to be equal, right? I don't that's, want everyone to be equal. Right. This shit doesn't work. But, but <laughs> before, but before that, I was like, oh yeah, maybe maybe that's, that's ah, yeah, that's 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 the usual stupidity of yeah. youth, yeah. exploited by some 
jackasses. Thank you. That, that'll be that'll be all on the communists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you do you think that sci-fi writers have a have a role in the in society, like either to get people excited about the future or or give them a little, you know, fear about about what's, well, what's maybe what's going maybe to come? They, of course they have a role, and it's it's a it's a it's a tricky situation because sci-fi is still kind of a ghetto. It's not treated seriously at one hand. On the other hand, you got a lot of like sci-fi stories turning into movies and defining the direction of, of science or becoming a warning, as you just said, of the wrong direction that the, the, the culture or society is potentially going to. Yeah. Although, what I can see from the progress of Facebook, some warnings do not work. You know, what um, the Big Brother didn't achieve with the installation of the, the compulsory system of video surveillance, Facebook, with their cute cartoons, did. I think Facebook is the fourth Reich, I'm telling you. Uh -huh. And Zuckerberg, that's, that's a dangerous type, you know. No, she's not a devil, he's just an idiot, socially awkward, awkward guy who just fucked one girl in his entire life. And he's, this guy is dictating the norms of morale to the entire humanity. Well, fuck you, Mark. You know, learn about life before you explain us what the real life is and what you're supposed not supposed to do here, you know? You mean censoring uh, stuff? Censoring things, you know, trying to create an algorithm to form our day, shape our day, what we're supposed not supposed to, to see. Like, I don't want this. I don't want Facebook to interfere in my emotional sphere. Mostly because him and his entire like staff of programmers are just sociopaths who spend their entire days doing their like mechanical work and they don't know anything about human relations. Why these people are supposed out of their fucking ideas like try to define and redefine what our like the, the very complicated emotional systems function like, you know? But that's kind of funny that they didn't have to hack anything, that people provided their own yes. things online. Because we, we are lonely. Willingly. Willingly. We're lonely and we need to be appreciated. And they exploit these two things. They, they give us illusion of not being lowly, lonely, an illusion of being estimated, appreciated by other people with these likes. They give us two fakes, two, two illusions, the feeling of community and the feeling of being needed and appreciated and they feed us with the publicity. That's what Facebook is about. It's not just a project to change the humanity. First of all, it's a project to just sell us goods and services. That's a business thing. This is an empire that exploits to our biggest vulnerabilities. And this is pretty disgusting. And of course, it's just, just like I can complain about it. I can accuse him of being Hitler, but I'm addicted to it. That's the worst thing. I'm checking my fucking Facebook, even personal profile, not to speak about my like, like pages, I don't know, like 20 times a day. Well, I guess you're not the only one. Um, of course, we are addicted. A lot of people do that. But, of course, but they, they are handling that irresponsibly, you know, and then I would rather them hire some, some good psychologists or philosophers to guideline their, their experiments on human beings than uh, business consultants, you know. That's like that when you have a, a social network that one billion people subscribe to, that's a fucking responsibility. Right. You cannot treat With great it power comes great responsibility. But uh, you know, when when Snowden came out and, and 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 said all those things that he said, at first people were like, oh oh my god, hey, let's maybe stop putting all those things online, and and then a year passed, maybe two, and and they all pretty much gave up on that and by now I think rarely anyone thinks about you know being tracked and and uh, a lot of people have that sort of mentality which I also have that my life is not that interesting so if someone steals it it's not that big a deal I don't until have, the moment when your life becomes interesting right right but, but I don't have anything to hide so that's why Zuckerberg said I remember that word that that wording he said why should you be uh, preoccupied, worried about people seeing what you like and what you dislike? If you're a decent person, you have nothing to hide. Right. Well, fuck you, Mark. Who defines what's decent? That's one 
And the second thing is, things happen. Regimes change, democracies become dictatorships, and things that are acceptable become unacceptable. Look at Harvey. Again, the things that were completely in the standards of the industry with a wave become completely unacceptable. So what are you doing with your practices? I'm not speaking about sexual harassment or rape, but the, the, just the standards of behaving between the sexes, what you're supposed to tell, to tell a girl and not supposed to tell a girl, and how the girl's supposed to react. What a girl, like look at Mariah Carey, what a girl can afford doing, like can allow herself doing. What a man can do to a man, you know, that's fucking changing. And now things that were normal two years ago are disgusting now. It can crush your life, it can smash your career into pieces, finish it. So uh, I don't want people to be, to be like following and collecting information about what I'm doing and I want them to be collecting information about what other people are doing. Private life is called private for a reason, you know? Yeah, but that's, that's, you, got, you kind of get those two options, which is you either put stuff online or you don't. And when you don't, you, you kind of become this paranoid guy that freak that duct tapes your front-facing camera and, and oh, the yeah, laptop. Yeah. Zuckerberg duct tapes it, <laughs> by the way. By the way. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so, so, uh, Just duly noted. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, do you do that, do that yourself? I don't do that, no. Why not? What's the worst thing? They see me jerking off? Yes. Well, you know, everyone's jerking off, you know, so... Well, well it's not, not everyone. Secret. Don't, don't be speaking about everyone. Well, maybe, maybe... Well, be 90%. Maybe my 90%. grandfather doesn't now. Yes. But, <laughs> except for him, I'm sure, pretty, I'm pretty sure that people use these wonderful opportunities provided by... The internet. The internet, yes. And that, that, the, 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 the standards of moral are changing, too. And before, nobody would ever admit they're watching porn. Now people just casually talk about it anywhere, you know. Girls admit it, boys admit it, whatever. So this is changing. But at the same time, I don't want the, the, the standards of privacy, tracking, and transparency to change, you know. I think that nobody's comfortable with that, really. But people agree to accept it because because gadgets are an addiction and they cannot give up it, you know. Plus, we all know, and we've we, we read researches about it, we know that the developers of applications make them addictable. Yeah. They build it in that way, design it in a way that you want to come back and you want to check the update, you know, and then they use pretty much the same tricks and it works. Can you blame them? Well, they're doing business, everyone's doing business. I just don't want their business to interfere into my private zones, you know? Hmm. Wouldn't you do it the same way? If you were building, like, a social network? There are always ways to be decent and honest and still get some buck, you know? Yeah. You don't have to, like, nobody's, now, right now, nobody's forcing you to, co to cooperate with the state of the social services, unless you're North Korea. But people choose to because it's comfortable and because that's where, like in Russia, I'm speaking about Russia, because that's where money is. And like, I got a whole bunch of people who I know, like my pals, who come with all the new, cool brain and fresh ideas. They look for the state and the state organization to hire them because that's where the money is. Some people, you know, bring a total surveillance system, like video camera surveillance system in Moscow to the government because that's where the money is. So they help install Big Brother right now as we speak in Russia because that, that's, that's who's paying, you know. There is no big business paying for the project. So they would help bring the state of total control digitally because they just want to, you know. Who, who's forcing them? No one is forcing them. Without their help, that would probably take the state like decades. But there are new bright minds, 20-ish, 30-ish, who voluntarily help it. Well, it's a brave new world, man. It's a brand new world. But uh, what I want to say is that every step in your life, I guess, you're tempted. You know, and devil is just a metaphor. But you're tempted all the time to get what you want quicker, but 
giving up certain things in you. Betraying your friend and partner here and there, working for the state, this party or that party, doing things you don't really believe into, you know, get more money for quicker because they ask you to identify yourself with things that you're not really for, you know, and people pr progress quicker if they don't give shit about moral things. At the same time, you not necessarily you do not necessarily have to die in poverty. You can find a way to both achieve things. It will take probably a longer time and more effort, but staying loyal to what you initially were. It's possible. I know it's possible. It's not impossible. It's not just as easy. So the, the story about the, the, the devil's apple, the, the, the serpent and the apple and the temptation, of course it's metaphorical, it's always been like that. But it's metaphorically true. I mean, on, a, on, a, on some kind of a meta level, it is true that that happens all the time with almost every human being where he's being offered we're, we're being these tempted, yes. two choices. And that's, that's kind of, a, in some ways, more true than, than peop what people consider true, because those things can change, and this will probably last till the last human being is alive, right? Well, I think it's basically... Well, I, I, I define the good as the altruism, and the bad as the egoism. Hmm. I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think it's that simple, man. Well, if you, you, can, you can degrade it to that. Yeah. Well, who's a good person? A good person is a person who, to, who cares about others more than he cares about himself, not ready to sacrifice others for his own needs. The bad person is a person who cares about himself more than he cares about others, prepared to sacrifice others uh, but that's for his kinda, own needs. That's kind of tricky, because there are a lot of people saying they are standing up for those you know, poor guys. I'm thinking oh, that's about... Just, that's just regular bullshitting. Yeah. People, of course, the worse you are, the more you pretend to be a sacred person, a saint. That's a normal thing. First of all, that's a, that's a disguise. Then the, the, the more evil you are, the more you have to distract people's attention from that. The more you pretend to be a kind person. And have so a every, every person health. who's telling, I'm the kind one, that's the devil himself incarnated. Everybody who's doing charity in a historical way, that's a pervert. Or that's a, that's a, you know, like a killer, murderer. I'm pretty sure about it. You know, people who, the good people who do good things, do them quietly. quietly yeah. that, that's for sure. That's one of the things that you learn. You know, I'm pretty sure that everyone who's openly uh, fighting pedophilia is a pedophile. It's like Hitler was one quarter of a Jew. So they try, you try to eradicate in Jews yourself, instead you eradicate one, like several, several millions Jews outside. People either try to suppress the evil themselves, ostensibly fighting the evil outside, or they want to hide and disguise the evil in themselves, you know, ostensibly fighting the, the evil outside. So uh, with all people who, who claim that they're good, all these priests, you know, the church officials, all the good politicians who, like, you know, like, fight for the mor morale. Perverts. Idi either perverts or idiots or murderers. Pretty sure. All of them criminals. That's, that, that gives you a lot of topics to write about. Well, just just having that grasp on, well, uh, on reality, right? Politics, whatever is politics, and then the relationship between power and a simple person is one of the themes that yeah. mesmerizes me. Then truth and lies is a whole thing that is so unlimited and, and inexhaustible. You, know, you can like, write and speak about it like, for ages. And that's definitely one of the main things that I'm writing about. Like, staying, like, com why do we choose to believe in lies, even if we know that they're lies? Why do we reject the truth just on the, on the basis that it's uncomfortable to us? A lot of things, you know. And uh, definitely, whatever is politics is mesmerizing me, since, since I was a journalist. Well, I'd like to talk more about uh, those things with you, but I guess uh, you gotta go and you have a meeting with the with your fans in fifteen minutes. Oh my god! In fifteen minutes, man. Oh so, my so god! It's probably best we finish now. W wouldn't you say? Uh, I, I get it. like I don't want to be late. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, people are it's waiting. Rude. It's rude to be. It's, oh. it's rude, and we have a knock knock. That's KGB coming for me for everything I told. Ciao guys, subscribe to my Instagram. Can I say it? No, like, cut it.
Glukowski just the way it's uh, on the book. Thanks, man. Thanks.